I really loved your character, Georgia, and she's not a trophy wife or, uh, or girlfriend to priest at all, is she? She's yeah. very, there's a lot of equality there, and I just wonder if you could talk a bit about that aspect yeah. of her. Yeah. yeah. Georgia is his confidant. He, she is, you know, his business partner just as much as Eddie is in the story. I love that in this version we've definitely heightened her, you know, her status that she is now playing amongst the men, you know, and her voice is valued, her opinion is valued. So I love being in the position to depict that type of woman on screen. I, I just wondered how aware each of you were of the 1972 original movie when you were first approached about this and why you wanted to come on board for the 2018 version. Um, um, my dad showed it to me when I was very young, didn't really understand it, uh, I was like eight years old. <laughs> uh, but then I saw it again when I was older and I understood how much of an impact it had on black culture. So definitely wanted to be a part of it as soon as I heard about it. I was begging my agents, managers, please get me in the room, get me in the room. And uh, it happened. <laughs> my agent was like, okay, Jason, see, here's the thing. You know, you, it's, it's like a whole setup that they got going on on that side. You gotta handle your, it's, it's, it's a whole, I'm sorry, it's a whole situation. I shouldn't say that. This is so <laughs> Let's keep it moving. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Superfly has always been out in the world, in the culture. It's just kind of this omnipresent piece of filmmaking that has been around. So when uh, Silver Pictures approached me about remaking it, I felt uh, a responsibility to be true to the original story, be true to the original elements. And then once we've firmly set our, uh, you know what I mean, once we really found that foundation, then we could find where things change and the change coming out of necessity as opposed to just change for the sake of change right i didn't want to i didn't want to approach this like we knew better than that movie and in, and and essentially saying we knew better than the audience we know what you uh, no i want to say no i want to say the audience is right and the audience is smart and the things that worked the first time will work work another time we just need to update the things around it. And this is in the context of other powerful women as well, isn't it? There's the fierce mother who's the head of the drug cartel. Yes, and then the police fierce. detective played by Jennifer Morrison yes. as well. Was that something that attracted yes. you in the script as well? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, the script was a page turner for me upon booking the role, reading it, just was so excited how, you know, entertaining and how much um, action there was. But like you said, yes, the women and how they were written in this film and depicted with just such so much strength and authority. Um, it was fun. It was very fun for us. Oh, I love the uh, the closeness between your characters. Wes. This is the bro. And they kind of they're both criminals, kind of in the, eye of the eyes of the law. Right. But we really care about them as yes. audience members. Just tell us about creating that on screen relationship between the two of you. I think it happened off screen. And right. That's how we didn't have to create it because right. it just happened when we met each other. We became so cool with one another. Had deep conversations every night, four or five hours up till crack of dawn. Then have to go straight to work after that. You right. know, just us really connecting on that level made it uh, transpire on screen. And our British accents, we have to say this because you are from the UK, we did this every day on set. Right. <laughs> and Joe was like, excuse me, Joe was like, guys, stop with the accent. You're gonna do it when you're trying to do the movie. We're like, no, we got it. But we'd always like talk and try and like do our best version. It's not like the greatest, but yeah. it's not bad. So oh, it goes this, give me. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's, it's, I don't know, I think we put together like a major, major, major task. Yeah. In, in a short amount of time. In a short amount of time. You know, but everybody was on the same sort of page, you know what I mean? Like one band, one sound. We all want this to be good. So no matter how many 17 hour days we had or whatever it was, like it was something that we knew we could leave with our dignity dealing with, you know what I mean? So yeah. it, it was his own beast. And it's quite rare in a movie, I think, where we see um, a character who in the eyes of the law is a, a criminal, but um, we're kind of rooting for them in a way, and they, they've got so much charisma. And yeah. Can you just talk about creating that with the character of Priest and, and Trevor? Yeah, Priest is a, a real great anti-hero. I mean, in the original movie, the way we work, once you introduce someone to a character, you can make someone really, really bad. But since we met them first, that's who we're rooting for, just how our brain works. And um, the, original, the original movie, Priest was hardcore. Like, he was not playing games. Uh, this one, we kind of embraced what it means to be the hero of a story. So his moral compass is in check, uh, how he operates, you like him, and you see what he's doing. And even though he's doing something wrong, he's not doing it in a wrong way. He is not, he's not this super violent, crazy, flashy drug dealer. He's the drug dealer you'd want to be around. 
And um, yeah, it just sets the right tone. There's always there's always a place and time for an anti-hero. And one of the elements that people really remember from the original movie is the music, of course, and Curtis Mayfield's mm -hmm. um, con contribution to that. What did you want to bring with that element um, for this movie? Same thing. Um, when we broke down the original film, not just did we break down the story, we broke down elements. So uh, the music's a thing, the hair's a thing, the car's a thing, the fa like all these things that really, the elements that made the movie that people remember 40 years later. So the music being the thing, we said, what about it? Is it the songs or is it the person? So, okay, well, he has a singular vision for the, the movie. Um, Curtis brought something all his own, and he spoke with a singular voice. So we came to Future to do the same, as opposed to, you know, looking at the soundtrack, and we need a record like this, and we need a record like that. The soundtrack is a soundtrack. It's a classic. It can't be touched. We're not trying. What we took from the original is the idea that one person takes the reins of the music and then leads that charge. And then from there, Future, his team, all of us came together to shape the world uh, and pull in other records that would, you know, inform, you know, what do they listen to at a party? What do they listen to at the club? What are the, what are the sounds of that world? But everything came from Future and the team he has around him and all of us working together to really craft something that has new and original music that's good and fun and just exciting. Can you tell us a bit about creating the on-screen relationship with Trevor? Trevor's so fun. <laughs> it's easy to get along with Trevor. You know, he has that personality. I'm sure you've met him. And, you know, he's just fun. He's he's sings, dancing all the time. He always has his energy. He plays games with you to kind of warm you up a bit. He, he's that guy on set, always talking to everyone. And um, so it was easy to fall into having great chemistry with Trevor. And even watching his chemistry with Jason's character, Eddie, on screen, it's undeniable. You can tell that they are truly friends in real life. Um, and we definitely created a family with, you know, with all the guys. It's, it's been a delight working with them, for sure. And he didn't get all the best outfits. You got some pretty great costumes yes. yourself as well. I love that burgundy um, outfit. Yes, yes, for the house that's party. That's one of my yep. favorites. I love that suit. It's so, and I love what we did with George's character because if you notice, most of the time, the women in the other scenes are a little more revealing. Whereas Georgia can wear a suit to a house party and still command the attention in the space. You know what I mean? She's definitely um, doesn't have to compromise herself in any type of way. Still it can be just as sexy, covered um, and professional and, ha and carries a poise and elegance about her too. And Trevor, tell us about the look of the character. The clothes are obviously very important and the hair. Yes. What about that aspect? Yeah. So uh, I met with Antoinette, the costume designer, weeks before I went down to Atlanta. She asked me kind of what I had in mind, and I said, skinny jeans, boots, long coats. That's all I had. And she was like, oh my God, that's exactly what I had in, in mind. I said, turtlenecks maybe. So we threw some turtlenecks in there. Um, and then when it came to the hair, me, Joel, and Dur uh, X were going going round and round. Okay, is it gonna be curly? I was like, it has to be straight. They were like, but do we wanna go straight? I was like, we need to go straight. Maybe not go all the way down, but it has to be some type of rem uh, resemblance to the old film. And uh, so we finally agreed on the part with the straight hair. And it's, it's a superhero look, you know what I mean? And Atlanta in the movie doesn't just seem like a backdrop. It feels very much integral to yes. the story. You just talk a bit about... I mean, that. Atlanta's important. Atlanta now is what Harlem was then. Um, if you're a big artist, if you got a hit song locally in Atlanta, you actually have a hit song worldwide, you know? Um, even the BMF were these very famous drug dealers in Atlanta. And, you know, Nicky Barnes in, in the 70s was a famous drug dealer from Harlem. Like, even being a crook in a town like this makes you world famous. So, um, for today, it really felt like this is the place it needs to be set. And it just gave us the right background for, for this story today. And I feel moving it out in New York also said we're, we're doing something different. It's, it needed a change. I think if we went back to New York, it would not quite work the same way. And how would you define the word sup superfly? What does it mean to you? Superfly is having confidence, wearing whatever it is well, whether it's your job, your relationship, relationship, your sexual orientation, the clothes, your hair, wearing all of it with confidence and still having humility at the end of the day. It's undeniable. Like, you just can't deny the real, you know? And being superfly is like, Parallel parking a train. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's that I'm critical. using that. I'm still in that. Parallel parking a train. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I say it's uh, being true to who you are at all times. And like you said before, whether you're, uh, your clothes, even if your clothes don't match, people still want to dress like you. Right. Because it's about the internal. 
and how superfly are you yourself or what's the most superfly thing about you would you say <laughs> my hair i'd say i think i got some pretty fly hair by accident i didn't ask for it it's just there it popped up one day <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you man ladies and gentlemen you're watching hey you guys hey you guys huh hey you guys, is yeah. that from the goonies it is indeed, yeah. nice hey